visitors who are unfamiliar with the Church of Christ come into a worship assembly on the first day of the week of the church, and one of the things they notice is that the singing is carried out without accompaniment of mechanical instruments of music. Another thing is that they will notice on the first day of the week in such assemblies that the Lord's Supper is offered as one of the acts of worship. And this morning I would like to speak to you about the church and the Lord's Supper. The great importance of the Lord's Supper can be seen by the fact that Christ himself on the very night of his betrayal after since they were Jews and living under the law they had celebrated the Passover that is Christ and his disciples out of the Passover our Lord instituted the Lord's Supper Matthew 26 verses 26 through 8 reads and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it. And he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the covenant which is shed are poured out for many as the American standard has for unto the remission of sins. You can find that account also covered by Mark in Mark 14, 22 through 24. And the inspired Luke in Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. I want to make this passing remark about the word cup. Many, many, many years ago, certain of our brethren equated the word cup with container. And back in the country days of a hundred years ago and before, many times all they had was a couple of glasses, maybe only one. Sometimes it was an empty snuff glass. Other times, some other glass container. And they would simply pass it around in the time of the taking of the Lord's Supper. Now, you must remember that in those days or the days that when you came by a well of water, there would be a gourd dipper or some other kind of dipper and people all drank after one another and they thought nothing of it. That may sound strange to you. But I still can faintly remember those days as they faded. But still where some people had a well of water, they would have a dipper that would be hanging beside it. But as time went on and people became knowledgeable of hygiene and all that, that meant and the germs and so forth then uh, the drinking of a something out of a everybody drinking out of a cup same cup same container brought about problems and people began to go to multi containers to offer the Lord's Supper and the fruit of the vine in and because people simply were ignorant, and I mean that kindly, they did not know. They just equated a cup with a container. They thought things were being violated because there were many containers and there wasn't one container. They failed to realize that the word cup referred to the contents. And you can have many containers as we do here this day, and yet you have only one cup. That one cup is the fruit of the vine which the Lord made clear represented his blood shed for the remission of sins. So I wanted to get that out 
in the beginning of this study. Now, in the New Testament, the Lord's Supper is called the Lord's Supper, as we've said. Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 20. The Lord's Table, in the chapter preceding that, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 21. It's called Communion in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. It's referred to as Breaking Bread in Acts 2, verse 42. Acts 20 and 7. And as you look around about you, you will hear also the name sacrament was by some adopted for the supper, denoting the an oath or a vow. Others called it the Eucharist, which literally means giving of thanks. Because before participating, thanks were presented for the supper. That's the blessing when it says that the Lord blessed the bread and blessed the fruit of the vine. All that means is he thanked God for it. But now here's the thing. We are to act on the basis of the authority of the words of the Bible. And when you read your Bible... Such names as sacrament and Eucharist are never used in the New Testament of the Lord's Supper. And Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So we don't use sacrament and Eucharist in referencing the Supper. We use the terms the Holy Spirit used. The Lord's Supper is a commemorative feast, if you would call it that. It never was meant to be a meal where you satisfied your physical needs and your hunger. It's a memorial to the sufferings of Christ and his death. And we show forth his death till he come again. It's to remind those who partake of it of just what it took to forgive their sins. The shame and the agony and the suffering of Christ on the cross, who did not deserve that, but yet he yielded his life to save us. It is a communion in the sense that we are communing with Christ and showing forth his death that he come again and in memory of his body offered in sacrifice and his blood shed for the midst of our sins. It is a a proclaiming or a declaration in that once a week in the worship assembly of the saints, it portrays the body which Christ gave up on the cross willingly and lovingly and the blood that he shed from that body on our behalf. And since the Bible makes it clear that life is in the blood, when he shed his blood, he gave his life. Now, there are three looks of the supper. Not a better way to put it. We look backward as we partake of the Lord's Supper and the worship assembly of the saints. We look backward to the cross and we remember the death of Christ. But yet, the thing about the death of Christ is that he kept pointing out he won't stay dead. And so we look forward to the second coming of Christ who has ascended up on high, ever living to make intercession for us and ruling at the right hand of God through the authoritative word that is his New Testament system. That's two ways. But as children of God, those who are of Christ, Christians, we look inwardly to examine ourselves and to partake of it in a worthy manner. Now, if you'll read 1 Corinthians 11, verses 26 through 29, where Paul is correcting the abuses that the Corinthians were making in their worship and calling what they were doing, observing the Lord's Supper, you'll find out that's where we can draw those views from, those looks backward, forward, and inwardly. 
Early on in the 19th century, as men were battling to leave the commandments and doctrines of men, and the churches of men founded upon those commandments and doctrines of men, Alexander Campbell, in the Christian system, on pages 265 to 292, we won't read all of that, but he had this to say on those pages. He wrote about, quote, breaking the loaf, unquote, or the Lord's Supper. He points out that there is a house on earth, the house of God, it is the church. And he cites 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 and 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. That in the house of God, there is the table of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 21. He then says, on the Lord's table, there is one loaf which shows that the church is to be united and not divided into sex. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. In fact, I'll pause here and inject this thought of my own. Everything about the identifying marks of the church found in the words of the New Testament indicate God's plan for oneness or unity and everything being done decently and in order. All Christians, the way that term is used and defined, are members of the house or family of God. And they constitute a holy and royal priesthood. So the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 3, verse 6, and 1 Peter 2, 5. Thus, we thank God for the Lord's table in the Lord's house. And it is comprised of the loaf of unleavened bread and the cup, the fruit of the vine. And we who are members of that church, who are Christians, children of God and God's family, without fear, may partake of it with love and joy in remembrance of the death of our Lord. And we're not ashamed to show forth his death till he come again. And Campbell says, and I quote here, when Acts 2 verse 42 and Acts 20 verse 7, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty and chapter 16, 1 and 2 are compared and added together, it appears, and I'm continuing to quote, that we act under the influence of apostolic teaching and precedent when we meet every Lord's Day for the breaking of the loaf. Now, I wanted to read that. We don't need that. We have the New Testament to learn about those things, but what is taught here in the Christian system by Campbell is the truth in this case. I know that because I can go read the very Bible he was studying and see what it said and check him out on it. But brethren, what this points out is that nearly 200 years ago, in fact, a little over 200 years ago, people were just as confused about this as they could be on anything. Their concept of the Lord's Supper was cluttered up with denominational viewpoints and man-made doctrines. And if you were to go here, those who sought to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity from the Bible they preached and only from the Bible they preached, and more specifically the New Testament of Christ, you would hear this kind of preaching over and over again, for that's one of the great sacred identifying marks of the church of our Lord when it comes to the worship of the church on the first day of the week. And the people of that time didn't know that. It was new to them for the most part. Oh, they knew something about a sacrament and that kind of thing, but they had no concept of the details of what the Bible teaches on the Lord's Supper. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, the bread or the loaf, mentioned 
appears to be since he was observing the Passover to keep the law and he instituted the supper out of the Passover, it appears to be the unleavened bread of the Passover feast. That's what the Lord and his disciples are eating to be faithful to the law of Moses. And that bread being unleavened was flour mixed with water and baked. And it's said that the Israelites made it I say it's said, if you study history, and I'm not saying we absolutely know, but there's no reason if they made unleavened bread, they wouldn't make it routinely like they did, and history brings this down to us, that they made it an oblong, a round cake. It's supposed to be about as thick as a man's thumb, and it was about like a platter. So it was broken when they partook of it. It didn't have any yeast in it, because it's unleavened. We know this too, that before the days of unleavened bread, the Jews, in wanting to be faithful, would literally clean their houses from bottom to top to remove any leavening out of the house, so the bread didn't have any leavening in it. And by a figure of speech, which is a where part stands for the whole, a synecdoche. The phrase breaking of bread is used to refer to the whole supper of the Lord. It may refer actually to the whole worship where part stands for the whole, but it certainly stands for the whole of the Lord's supper because there's more to the Lord's supper than literally and actually just breaking bread. This is a help in right and dividing the word of truth. It's a hermeneutical principle to understand just how language operates. The context usually, that is, the environment in which this term finds itself, determines the meaning of when it's used. The cup was a figure of speech where the containers put, as I said earlier, for the contents. And the contents in this case was the fruit of the vine, the grapevine, Matthew 26, 29. Now, who are the people that are to commune with our Lord in observance of the Lord's Supper? Well, all men everywhere at this very hour on the first day of the week have the obligation to worship God by faith. But all men aren't qualified to do that. Do you realize that everything that's enjoined upon a person to be faithful to God as far as being a Christian, God expects all men everywhere to do that because the Lord's authority governs all men. Now, they aren't qualified to do that. But they're going to give an account because they didn't qualify themselves. That's what we fail to realize sometimes. And so when it comes to the Lord's Supper, we're able to see that the Lord's table at which is partaken the Lord's Supper in the Lord's house. Which is the same as saying in the kingdom of the Lord. Because the house of the Lord is the kingdom of the Lord, is the church of the Lord, is the body of Christ, is the temple of the Lord. So only citizens of this kingdom are qualified to participate in this communion. Listen to Luke 22, 29, and 30. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, even as my Father appointed unto me. Now listen. That's Jesus speaking. That ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Language couldn't be clearer. The saints... And faithful brethren in Christ, Paul wrote to Colossians. And he says, who, who, who delivered us, that is God has, out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of God, dear Son, of the American Standard, says the kingdom of the Son of His love, Colossians 1, 2, and 13. Well, what do we learn from this as to who are to commune? Only penitent believers who have been 
baptized into Christ by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins and thereby they're added to the Lord himself. Only they are to partake of the Lord's Supper because their past sins have been remitted when the blood of Christ was applied to them in the watery grave of baptism. In other words, these are the ones who are qualified to commune. They're in the kingdom. They're citizens of the kingdom. Now, of course, we don't stand over the table and keep others away, but we have a responsibility, a great responsibility, to teach unbaptized people that they are not Christians. They're not in the family of God. They're not citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And they're participating in a meaningless act when they do so. Because this is reserved by the Lord for the citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the church, or Christians. So people must consider for themselves what's going on. Even as they must when we offer the plan of salvation, they must consider have I obeyed it from the heart or have I not? Now, what about the manner of partaking of the Lord's Supper? There was trouble among the members in Corinth in partaking of the Lord's Supper. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we understand what part of that problem was. The brethren there, at least some of them, had changed the Lord's Supper into an ordinary feast. And they did that to satisfy the appetites of their physical body. And Paul says, now when you did that, you failed to discern the body and blood of Christ. You have turned the Lord's Supper into something that was never was meant to be. Their irreverent manner, and underscore that, their irreverent manner was a result of their bad spiritual condition. Our bad spiritual conditions arise because we either just completely neglect what we know is right and go against it or we don't know any better. Well, you'll remember something else kind of goes along with that among the people who were members of the church of Corinth. And that is that they were divided among themselves into various parties. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 and 13. And so on through the book, chapter 3, 1 through 4, chapter 11, verse 18. You'll remember there was a case of fornication among them, 1 Corinthians 5, that was not so much as named among the terrible, lascivious Corinthians who were not Christians. On matters of where there was disagreement in the church, brethren were going to law before non-Christians, 1 Corinthians 6. Some had even denied the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. You know, you might expect people who were doing that because they were so cut loose from the most fundamental matters of the church to pervert the Lord's Supper. And they did, 1 Corinthians 11. In verses 27 through 29, Paul had this to say. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord, now this is the American standard, and listen to this, in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh, eateth and drinketh judgment unto himself, if he discern not the body. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. Now you'll read the King James Version unworthily. And some of my brethren over the years have thought, well, if I know I've committed a sin, even though it's known only to me and God, or in my family, or somewhere, then I can't take the Lord's Supper because I'm unworthy. 
If you look at it from that standpoint, none of us are worthy. But that's not in the context. That's not the message. That's not the problem Paul was solving among those brethren. They had failed to discern the body and blood of Christ because they had turned the Lord's Supper into just a, what we have basically once a month in our eating session. It's a fearful thing to do anything contrary to the authority of the Lord, whether it's singing or prayer, whatever it may be. And so it would be in observing the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So what is he saying? Well, he's saying those who do not partake of the Lord's Supper in a right manner are going to be judged. We do strive to emphasize that our worship and every act of it must be in spirit and in truth. That's what the Lord taught in John 4. Our minds ought to be on God to whom we are offering all of this worship. And thus our minds roam one another, such as in singing when we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing make melody in our heart and teaching one another. So we must keep our minds reined in, if you want to call it that, in the proper frame, and certainly the Lord's Supper. Whenever anyone irreverently partakes of the Lord's Supper, if I understand anything about the meaning of words as Paul corrects these brethren in Corinth of so long ago, he's placing his, son, his soul in jeopardy of being eternally lost. We can say it this way, when the Lord, you take all the New Testament says on the kind of music God wants in worship of Him, and it all is singing, and somebody moves in some sort of mechanical instrument of music, same can be said of that. Or if when we're praying, our minds are somewhere else other than being led by the one who's leading us in prayer, as we pray, we're doing the same thing. We're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So on every act of worship, we should examine ourselves. And we should prove ourselves to be sure if our motives and attitudes in approaching the Lord's Supper or any other avenue of worship is genuine, sincere, and honest. The next question is, well, when are we to commune? When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he told his disciples, this do in remembrance of me, Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. Paul repeats that when he's correcting the problems in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 25. Now, I want you to get this. This is not an optional matter. I'll do it if I want to or I won't otherwise. It's a required thing. It's imperative. It's an obligation. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 teaches the saints that when they meet on the first day of the week to worship God, they are to give of their means, their financial means, as they've been prospered. Literally, this assembly is a coming together on the first day of every week. And that's what it says in the Greek, katamien sabatu. It means every first day of the week. In 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen through 33, well, we learn something else as he corrects those brethren, that the Lord's Supper is placed in a required assembly. Verses 17, 18, 20, and 33. How many times does he have to say that before it gets through to the people who say, we only operate as the book teaches? And yet I think I have seen this transgressed among the brethren as much as anything could be when it comes to worshiping God. Acts 20 and verse 7, Luke records that upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. 
Now, it'll be noticed here that it says the, the first day of the week. A little simple reasoning here helps. How many times yearly does the first day of the week come around? Well, I think there's 52 weeks in a year, and that means there's 52 first day of the week. When Christians assemble together on the first day of the week, and that's our Sunday, to break bread and engage in all the acts of worship God says Christians are to do on that first day of the week or in that first day of the week assembly, we are simply following the pattern that's set out in Exodus 20, I mean in Acts 20 and verse 7. Now, let me go back over to Exodus. Concerning the Sabbath day, which is not the first day, it's the seventh day. And in Exodus 20 and 8, the scripture says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So under the law of Moses, to be faithful, they follow the teaching of the scriptures or what they were to do on the Sabbath day. Now you'll notice in this that the law of Moses did not say on every Sabbath day, but we're still in the same position. There's one seventh day, which is the Sabbath day in every week, and there's 52 weeks of the year, and they knew every time the seventh day came around, that was a Sabbath day, and they would do what the law of Moses said they ought to do on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day. The faithful Jew kept the Sabbath day only 52 times yearly in obedience to the commandment of God. Even as the faithful Christians who are now under the law of Christ meet on Sunday to assemble and in that assembly worship God by the avenues or acts he set out in the authoritative word of his son. So 52 times yearly they break bread as the Bible defines that along with the other acts of worship. The first day of the week is unique to the Christian age. Sunday, which we know it as, the first day of the week, was the day on which the Lord Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Matthew 28, 1. In fact, all, all of the accounts of the gospel records that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first day of the week was the day of the, that the church, you'll remember, was established in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2. It is the day when Christians, following the apostolic authority, were accustomed to assemble, Acts 20 and 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. That's important to understand. Now, I hope you will realize that everything we've studied thus far on the Lord's Supper is not that difficult to understand if we're cautious and careful about the reading of the words of the Scriptures that cover the Lord's Supper. Now, we could get into the so-called apostolic fathers and even scholars I guess that's what we would call them, very learned men, among the denominations would point out to you that it was the first day of the week in which Christians customarily assembled. But there's no use in doing that when we already have the New Testament. If you want to, just to see what they said, that's fine. But we have the Bible. We don't need anything else. It will be the sole judge, especially the New Testament of the Christian age, on the day of judgment. We need to be mindful of this. Now, there's some things we might mention here as to what some people refer to as the Lord's Supper or the sacrament. Roman Catholic Church holds to the doctrine of transubstantiation with regard to the Lord's Supper. Here's what they say on that. They declare that when the bread and fruit of the vine are blessed by the priest, it actually becomes the literal flesh and blood of Jesus. If you want to look at any of their material, they will tell you that. 
in the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, that doctrine is set forth, and I quote, in the Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood, together with soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the whole Christ, canon one. Goes on to say, the whole substance of the bread is converted into the body, and the whole substance of the wine into the blood, canon two. Well, their attempt to justify this position is to take Jesus' statement, this is my body, and this is my blood, as literal language, which it is not. If it was literal language, and he says, take the cup, and the cup's a container, they'd have to drink the container. In reply to this Roman Catholic position, we note that the Lord instituted then his memorial supper. A memorial does not present the reality. Now think about that for a minute. A memorial does not present the reality. Go to any memorial you want to, and it doesn't present the reality, but it reminds you of the reality. In this case, it'd be the literal flesh and blood. But it doesn't. It just simply reminds you the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine of what Christ did. All this is is metaphorical language, a, compar a comparison in which the likeness is implied rather than stated explicitly or in just so many words. Jesus used that kind of language all the time. I am the door, John 10, 7. When you think he really meant he's a literal door? He said, I am the vine, John 15, 5. Nobody understood him to say that I am an actual grapevine. Now, if Christians actually ate the flesh and blood of Jesus, it would be nothing less or more than cannibals. And this would present a problem in regard to the prohibition against eating blood, Acts chapter 15, verse 29, which we are forbidden to eat. And the Roman Catholic Church acknowledges that in the Mass there is no visible change in the bread and wine. That they continue to have the same properties. They have the same color. They have the same taste. They have the same smell. They have the same weight. They have the same dimensions. Well, that's sufficient to refute this doctrine to point out that their position involves an, an impossibility. It is impossible that the attributes of sensible properties of bread and wine should remain if the substance has been changed. They're speaking in enigmas, or put it more bluntly, absurdities. In a Roman Catholic catechism of Christian doctrine, the question is asked, is the Holy Mass one and the same sacrifice with that of the cross? Question 278. They give this as an answer. The Holy Mass is one and the same sacrifice with that of the cross, inasmuch as Christ, who offered himself, a bleeding victim on the cross to his heavenly Father, continues to offer himself in an unbloody manner on the altar through the ministry of his priest. Well, that means that the Church of Rome holds that the Mass is a continuation of the sacrifice that our Lord made on the cross on Calvary. That it's in reality a re-crucifixion of the Lord over and over and over again in an unbloody manner. Well, we, we take very strong exception to such a position. The so-called sacrifice in the Mass certainly is not identical with that on Calvary. I don't care what the priest says. There is in the Catholic Mass no real Christ, no suffering, and no bleeding. Now what's interesting about that is, is when you read Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. And it makes it clear that a bloodless sacrifice is ineffectual. 
But that's what they've turned it into in their false doctrine on the matter. That Christ's sacrifice on Calvary was complete in that one offering. And that it was never repeated. It's set forth time and again in the New Testament. Listen. Who needeth not daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Now listen, here's what Christ did. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Hebrews 7, 27. Then in Hebrews 9, 12, through his own blood, entered in once for all into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. And you can go on, I'd recommend read a number of passages, especially chapter 9, chapter 10 of Hebrews, to see that teaching that refutes Roman Catholicism on this matter. So the language of the New Testament is thus perfectly clear. He offered one sacrifice for sins forever, Hebrews 10 and 12. And Paul says that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, Romans 6, 9. Well, these are some things about the Lord's Supper that are very important. To understand the first principles and fundamentals of this act of worship in which we shortly, if time goes on, will engage. Ever keeping in mind that our worship is always to be done in spirit and in truth, the right disposition of mind toward God and in truth as the truth teaches. That we must constantly remind ourselves of these fundamentals and these basics that we might keep the church, the Lord's church, and us faithful in it. If you're not a child of God this morning, we're grateful we can offer this invitation to you that if you have believed in Christ, repented of your sins, and confessed your faith in Him as the Son of God, you can complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, God's second law of pardon is for you if you sin to repent of sins, confess them, pray to God for forgiveness. So if you're subject to the Lord's good invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.